Okay. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, who also needs no introduction. Her extensive bio is also on the conference website at uh, www.cornell.systems. So I won't read it out loud here, but you can go check it out and, and read about her extensive background. Uh, Dr. Laura Cabrera was first a colleague and then a partner in life and work of mine. Um, she is, of course, my favorite systems thinker and speaker. As I mentioned yesterday, Laura has led the research and the push to make systems thinking accessible to anyone. Uh, she's led the push to bring it to policy and evaluation and all kinds of other areas uh, and making big, big changes in those worlds. Um, this work alone has sort of quantifiably affected millions of people, literally, uh, that we can count worldwide and qualitatively far more that, that we hear about that, uh, that we can't count. So uh, I will say that people always ask us with a fair bit of skepticism. Uh, you, you teach together, you work together, you live together. Isn't it trying at times? And I can honestly say that it is not, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, Laura is the best colleague and the best partner uh, one could imagine, a consummate professional, a great researcher, a teacher, and, and many other things who's widely loved by her students and colleagues and, of course, her family. Um, so I guess I would say love. I highly recommend it. Uh, so without further ado, we're gonna, I'm going to take uh, about 30 seconds to switch uh, from me to Laura, and I will we'll have Laura uh, introduce Laura and, and uh, Dr. Laura Cabrera, and she'll be talking about an agent-based approach. It's good to see you all again. I'm glad to be back for day two of this awesome systems thinking conference. Uh, so I am excited to share with you many things, but I'm going to try to reduce it in the interest of being simple about things as I've been trained to do. There are five things that I really want to try to get across to you in a short amount of time. So just bear with me. It might feel like a fire hose, but I'm trying to keep it really simple because that's sort of my style. So what I really want to do is I want to talk for a few minutes about the implications of this VUCA world and the resultant need for a different uh, way to think about the complex systems we all care about. I wanna highlight just for a couple of minutes, some of the research that we've been doing on how we increase the complexity of thought. And I'm gonna spend some fair amount of time really walking you through uh, the ABA method, what it is, how we do it, those kinds of things. And then hopefully I will show you how these things all connect in a powerful way of thinking about the kinds of things we all care about and um, solving the kinds of things that we're thinking about. So without that, so let me just start with a fish tank. And I wanna describe some of the latest research that we've done with our graduate students here at Cornell and share some of the results uh, to give you a sense of how systems thinking can be taught, tested, and then also developed uh, for individuals. So one of the things that we did, and we have more than 20 different types of studies like this. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them to give you a sense of what we've been doing. All of them have been published and we can, obviously we'll put them up on this uh, conference website so you can read them. But the fish tank study was particularly interesting. We conducted four experiments, each with a sample of just around 400 respondents. And what happened is each one of these groups were shown this simple image of a fish tank on a slide and they were asked to describe what they saw. They would fill in their responses. And then after that, they would read a very short treatment on one of the patterns of thinking, distinctions, systems, relationships, or perspectives. And in, and in a sense, they were sort of taught one of these patterns with this short passage of text, just the basics of it, which took a couple of minutes to read. They were then asked to look at the image again, the same image of the fish tank, and to, just, and to describe what they saw. And we had some really interesting results. Now you can see my fish tank. I've been talking about a fish tank, not realizing you weren't seeing a fish tank, but I'm an adaptive system, so we're okay with that. So anyway, what I was saying is we've done four studies with the fish tank, people saw the image, then we, we taught them one of the patterns of thinking, and then we had them look at it again and tell us what they saw. And what was really fascinating about that is across these 1500 people, it's fine, it's showing me. 
1,500 people, you know, each, each one uh, learned one of the patterns of thinking. Just after a really short treatment of learning one of the patterns of thinking, they actually significantly improved the complexity and the robust, robustness of their thinking, which means that in just a short amount of exposure or training around systems thinking and DSR and P particularly, that people actually saw more of reality and they saw it better. In other words, they had more sophistication, more depth in their answers of what they saw. They saw more in the picture. They saw more of the things that were not only seen, but the unseen things that were implied. Uh, they saw more of what other people would have missed. They were able to take more points of view on the same image. And in a weird way, well, not in a weird way, and significantly, they just had better analysis of what they actually were seeing. So if you think about these results across this group, and what you can see is the way we measured it is you can see the pretest, which was like before they learned DSRP is in red, and blue is the post. And what we see is measured by, we, 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 we hung into some of the research on language as it exhibits complexity of thought, the increases in their language and their answers actually reflected a greater complex understanding of a simple system. Which means, here's the point, imagine what formal training in systems thinking could do. And the fact that we actually can teach skills that will increase cognitive complexity. That's important. We also have done some research which shows us uh, how to understand people's thinking patterns more broadly. And this is an additional study with a sample of more than 34,000 people, which showed when people are trying to think through something, most interestingly, 48% of people get stuck where they have that moment where they kind of freeze up and they don't really know what to do and they sort of end up doing nothing. But interestingly, among those who did do something, we noticed some patterns in they, they do some of the same things and they also don't do some of the same things that we know that work. And I wanna talk about that just a little bit further. So that research actually showed us and allowed us to get to a list of the things that people tend to do and tend not to do when they're thinking about things. So in other words, if you think about this chart, the things on the left are the things that we need to keep doing that. And we also need to do the, we need to do the things on the right to be better or more systemic in our thinking. So we tend to, we tend to make distinctions, but we fail to consider their validity and what we may or may not be excluding in our thinking. We also tend to organize stuff in part whole systems, which is a good thing, but we sometimes fail to seek the alternative ways of organizing or looking at systems across levels of scale. And when we're talking about relationships, we only do this occasionally, meaning we sometimes fail to do them in the first place. And that's important. We also don't really think about webs of causality. We, we tend to be more linear in the way that we think about things. And as you know from the things you've heard about in this conference so far, we want to be not only linear in the way that we think about things and look for different types of relationships. And also not surprisingly, humans tend to take only their own perspective. In other words, we fail to take multiple perspectives on things. And we also fail to take conceptual perspectives on issues, things like, well, we're more biased towards things with eyeballs or anthropomorphic perspectives. So the point of this is understanding uh, systems thinking practices or habits gives us insight into how to develop those, those skills in people, whether it's from you know, pre-K, my favorite, kindergartners, all the way to PhD and beyond, of course. And the final piece of research that I really want to just highlight a minute is um, with a sample of uh, just over a, a thousand people which showed us that we have a bias, a bias which is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, meaning that we are more confident than we are competent in our ability to think things through. Now let that sink in for a minute. We're more confident than we are competent in our thinking skills. And if you just take a moment and think about the dangers of being out of sync with that reality, you know, and the, the fact that we're sort of out of sync with reality in the first place, and we also think that we're more in sync with reality, 
we think we're better thinkers than we are, that could be problematic. And systems thinking is the way that we can bring competence in alignment with confidence. But let's just take this one step further. And this is where we're gonna cue into some of the research our certificate students have been working on in the past few years. I want you to think about the additional dangers when our models of analysis are out of sync with the reality that we live in, which George Casey talked about, this VUCA world, or as Heist said, this VUCA H world, this VUCA hyper-connected world. We live in a world that's characterized with highly, highly interconnected problems. And I'm confident that all of you at this uh, conference have something that you're trying to solve or that you're thinking about or you care about some sort of an issue. And just remember, we don't wanna think always as things as problems to be solved, but things that we can have impact on. We can ameliorate a condition, reduce an issue, lessen its effects on humans, those kinds of things. But if we have this mismatch between our tools and the problems, and I mean that problems in quotes specifically, we run the risk of creating policies, interventions, and programs that yield muted results, or they run inefficiently and waste limited resources. And most importantly, they don't reach their potential to really improve the human condition. This is why ABA, this is why we've been thinking about and really trying to figure out an agent-based approach to solving the kinds of complex problems we're talking about. And this is the number of systems that we're all dealing with that are complex adaptive systems. This is why we talk about CAS. This is why we study this. We teach our students about it because all the systems we care about are all CASs. And not only are the systems you care about CASs, the system of thinking that you use to think about those systems is also a CAS, as Derek talked about yesterday. And just as a quick two minute review before we get into ABA is just remember, this is the formula for complex adaptive systems. Agents following simple rules that creates a bunch of collective dynamics through all of those interactions. And that leads to emergent properties or system behavior. And that means that when we're trying to influence systems, we have to focus at the agent level, which is below the line. And that's how we're gonna get the results we want. And that's why we focused on ABA. So, so remember, for more simply, the micro multiplied makes the macro. And what agents do at the local level collectively shapes the outcomes of the system. So this is a simulation of an ant colony. You can see that the ants follow some simple rules and that they even adapt to the changing environment, which is the barricade in gray is going to move at some point. And they do this to identify a food source collectively, and then they return to the colony with food. Now these ants are following simple rules. And what's interesting is a bunch of, you know, little critters that have a single neuron are actually exhibiting great intelligence, even though they don't technically have the capacity for it. They're following three rules. They're randomly going out and looking for food. They're shooting a pheromone out of their rear ends to, when they find food, and then they return to the base. And then they never, ever, ever, ever cross a pheromone trail. And you can actually see them going out randomly and self-organizing around those rules from disorder to, to order. And this is what it looks like uh, in, a, in a graphic, which the emergent property is that we see that intelligent behavior, which is weird or surprising because we, act, we, we basically have, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but sort of dumbish kinds of organisms or ants. And you, you know, and you think to yourself, if I take one of these not so intelligent ants and then I add another thousand ants, how is it that we get something that's not stupid? We get something that's actually smart. Well, that's what we mean by emergence. This emergence isn't magically appearing. It's dynamically appearing based on the self-organizing behavior predicated on the simple rules that they followed. 
The three that I mentioned, looking for food, shooting the pheromone, and never crossing the trail. And to illustrate this point, Derek loves to do this in class too, but we imagine two ants and they're standing there in a heated debate around that third role, rule, which is to never cross the pheromone trail. And there's this rebel ant, we'll call him Brian for some random reason. We could call him Derek actually, that would be fun. <laughs> and then there's a rule follower, we'll call him John, uh, just for sake of this. So let's say Brian says to John, he's standing there right on the line, he's like, come on, man. Don't you think it's ridiculous that we can't cross this pheromone trail? I mean, what is that about? You can see this is tyranny in our system, right? And John says sheepishly, you know, I don't know, man. Maybe we should just do what it says and follow the rules. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. But imagine if Brian was successful. Imagine if Brian actually convinced John and all of the other ants to cross the pheromone trails. I mean, at the micro level, it seems pretty oppressive, right? That you can't cross the line. I mean, who really cares if you cross the pheromone trail? It seems sort of inconsequential. But what would happen if Brian was successful? What would happen is that the whole colony would die and eventually the species would go extinct. And the point is, sometimes the simple rules of systems, they don't seem profound, but you have to look at their dynamics, the dynamics of how they play out when a vast number of agent interactions are governed by a simple rule. It's not about the simple, it's not about the rule per se, but about how those rules play out in terms of emergence. Now you can think about those ants, but when we think about those two ants debating crossing the pheromone shell, sometimes we could think about, you know, how are we debating things in our human systems? Like we are often, often debating whether or not we should change the simple rules of the constitution, right? Rules like the right to assemble, freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, a free press, all of those things. You know, the point is not to debate those issues, and I'm not advocating for one side or the other in the myriad of debates and the distinctions that are being made politically. What I am cautioning is that these simple rules cannot be merely debated as if they only matter in the micro, because they play out dynamically in the emergent properties of the macro. So we have to see this connection even especially when the rules may seem to us unimportant or too extreme or too oppressive or too lenient. That is what is required of a caste mindset to, to understand that the micro multiplied makes the macro. And before complexity science had been developed or conceived, our founding fathers were brilliant enough to see this deep connection between simplicity and complexity. Now they didn't get everything right, that's for sure, but they did add in, in sort of all adaptive in order to form a more perfect union clause, and then the ability to make amendments to assure that our constitution is adaptive and evolutionary. So they developed a simple rule system to ward against despots and kings and rulers and tyrants and to ensure that power remained with the people. And, you know, the simple rules are being attacked from all sides in subtle and not so subtle ways. So I'm just saying we got to pay attention to that micro and the macro and the relationship between them. We know complexity is all around us. Simplicity is hiding underneath it. We've talked a bit about DSRP and BMCL are complex adaptive systems. DSRP are the simple rules that underlie the complexity of thinking and learning. And BMCL represents the simple rules that organizations need to be adaptive and to learn. So there's good news and bad news in that, right? The good news is that learning at the individual and organizational level can be simple. The, the bad news is that like those scientists, you know, that looked for the leader bird in the flocks uh, to really understand and see the simplicity underneath things, you have to change your paradigm or the way they're thinking about it. And that's not always easy for us to do. Now, that's why we need an agent-based approach when dealing with complex systems, issues, or concerns. 
And at this point, the tool that many of us uh, rely on and think about, and it's a great tool, is agent-based modeling. And I want to just talk about that for one minute and contrast it to ABA. So for those here, of you- As they wander around are, the market environment, interacting has been right there. Uh, also helping spread the word of here's this an new ABM. product. We're tracking our statistics down here, and we can see already the emergence, beginning of the adoption growth curve. And what you want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but what I want you to see is that you have system level results that are really cool. And that's the power of ABM. And you can do that over and over for many cycles. And you can see what happens over time. You'll see those trends. But what you also need to see for ABM is that when you, in order to run your program, you need really specific parameters and variables, which you can see in this graphic here. And here is, Herein lies the problem. For many complex adaptive systems, we don't really have this level of specificity in the variables that would allow us to program it in the first place. And this can be because the system is opaque. It doesn't reveal enough of its specificity. It also could be due to the condition of knowledge about the system is quite low, meaning we don't know much about it yet. And that's quite often the case with big complex adaptive systems, like the ones that people working in policy are dealing with every day. So I don't want you to get me wrong. Agent-based modeling is a very powerful method. It is one of the most powerful, but the secret here is that we don't often have what it takes to actually use ABM. And sometimes we will actually try to shoehorn it as a method sort of prematurely. So let me just talk about a few of the reasons why ABM is, a, is sometimes infeasible and why that led us to ABA. So ABA, ABM uh, requires, as I said, a level of specificity that is not always available. And this specificity often can yield construct validity problems meaning all the aggregate results of an ABM are only as good as the construct validity of all the agent and rule inputs into it. And sometimes it's difficult to define those variables. And also what's interesting and, and true for, for all of us is, you know, ABMs that involve human or human agents may have difficulty capturing a lot of things that we care about, like irrational behavior, subjectivity, complex psychology, because those kind of soft factors are difficult to quantify, calibrate, or justify. And then um, finally, the technical nature and expense of ABM can make it impractical. Uh, and that's something that we also can talk about more uh, in the Q&A. So here we are all of that preamble to get you to what we all really have been thinking about, which is the agent-based approach. And we focused on agent-based approach for all the things I've said prior to this, you know, CASs and all of that, but really it boils down to one uh, equation, which is the reason we need an agent-based approach or ABA is because the number of cases where, where CAS is applicable is far greater than the number of cases where ABM is a feasible method. And let me explain. Take, for example, this circle representing the universe of socio-technical systems and their problems. And then a near entirely overlapping circle, which will represent all of those that are also CASs, complex adaptive systems. And of those, this other circle, which marks the ones that are appropriate for ABM, and it's actually relatively small. And that leaves a lot of cas based socio-technical systems that actually need a new method of analysis. And that's agent-based approach. An agent-based approach is made up of three primary parts a DSRP systems analysis in which we sort of map out the system just to understand the system, a CAS analysis, which includes the agent, simple rules and emergent properties of the system and recommendations. 
uh, which are derived from our understanding of that system and focus on the agent level of influence to bring about change. So I'm gonna walk you through this step by step and uh, take it one thing at a time and just bear with me. And a lot of you know some of this and some of you don't. So we're gonna start with DSRP analysis. The first thing I say to our students all the time is stop trying to solve problems. Move towards understanding systems and make that always a precursor to solving problems or thinking about issues, understand your systems. And we start that with four basic questions, right? We generate a mental model of the system. We ask ourselves four things around DSRP. What are the distinctions I'm making when I'm exploring the system? What are its salient parts? Are there relationships among the parts that I'm not seeing? And what are the different perspectives I could take to better understand this issue? That's just how we get started with an analyzing the system using DSRP. So we start by making sort of a splat map of all of the distinctions we're thinking about. We ask ourselves, what are the things that are salient? What are the things that are not? You can imagine all kinds of examples. Just think of this as like post-its on a whiteboard or you can use software or you can just pencil and paper, whatever it does to get you to capture your thinking. Now, the one caveat I would say is when you are putting down those distinctions, the ideas that you're thinking about, always take a minute to consider the other, right? What is the other to the identity you're making? Is there an alternative way of thinking about it or an, or an opportunity cost for the way that you're thinking about something? And just as a quick example, if you think about human resources and you think of humans as resources to be managed, you may not fully understand the human systems in your organization because humans don't think of themselves that way. So ask yourself, is there a better way to think about human resources that doesn't really codify that bias? You use the word environment that could have many different meanings. It could mean an ecological system. It can mean social environment, cultural. So make sure that you're being clear in your distinctions uh, when you make them. Then we wanna make sure we're considering the relationships between those things, which are represented by the blue lines. Um, how are those things related? Does one thing lead to another? Notice that not all uh, A to B, sometimes there's feedback loops. There's all kinds of ways to think about relationships. And also importantly here, if you see this yellow arrow, we want to, if we can, distinguish the relationships we're thinking about, meaning label them, name them, think about them as a thing. You can imagine a lot of examples of that where you've got the relationship to biology and chemistry and the thing in between them is actually a thing called biochemistry as a quick example. Then we wanna think about systems. Do these things have parts, right? In this example, you can see in green, what we've done is we've asked ourselves, do any of these things in the system have parts and do they contain parts? And then extending that further, we wanna consider the relationships between and among the parts. And what you can see here is these blue lines. I'm trying to move out of my slide. The blue lines that are marked by the, the uh, pink arrows are where we're relating parts at the second level. Whereas that yellow uh, arrow is showing how we're relating two things at the top level in our system, two nodes. So we're gonna consider the relationships between the parts. So right now we've done sort of D and S and R, right? And this is an important one. And what I wanna talk about here is something that we know and love called an RDS. We wanna make sure, and this is a fu fundamental tenet of systems thinking and understanding systems, is that you take those relationships between things and you ask yourself, not only how can I distinguish it by giving it a name or an object in a map, but how can I deconstruct that system, that relationship into a system of parts? And that's called an RDS. They're really important because they help us get a much deeper understanding of the systems we're thinking about. Because you know a lot of the things are hidden in the relationships. And it's a simple three-step thing. You make a relationship, think about how are two things related, you ask yourself, is it important enough that it needs to be named and thought about differently? And then the final step is you break that relationship into its constituent parts. And that's an RDS, a relationship that's a distinction and a system. Here's two really quick examples. You can imagine there are physical relationships. This is a bicycle train system where you've got the rear cassette or the wheel. Then you've got this relationship with the chain, uh, the chain to the pedals. The chain itself has parts you can see and the relationship between those two links even lower in the map. 
So I'm just trying to get you to see that these things exist physically. The relationship between 25 million coffee farmers and producers and 500 million coffee consumers is another thing called a supply chain. That supply chain has uh, traders, roasters, grocers, and parts inside it as well. So the world exists in RDSs, so too our thinking should, should reflect that. And then we wanna also consider perspectives. We wanna talk about and think about what are the perspectives that we can think about and add to the, our understanding of this map. And there are two ways to think about this. One is we wanna move away from only taking anthropomorphic perspectives, things with eyeballs. We wanna add things like conceptual per perspectives, which my students do all the time. They take historical, social, health, political perspectives on any issue or policy that they're thinking about. And we wanna do that too. We wanna also distinguish between taking a perspective on the system versus perspectives of things that exist inside the system. So when you're thinking about that, make sure you're thinking about in versus on relative to the system. And then the last thing about your DSRP analysis, which is part of the ABA approach, is to really realize that DSRP, as we've been telling you, are not linear stepwise processes, that they are massively parallel and working all at the same time in different ways. So you can mix and match those things and be very fluid with thinking of DSRP as a way of analyzing systems. How much time do I have? Three minutes? Three minutes. Oh, well, I'm going to go fast then. All right. So remember also to always test our mental models of the system uh, carefully. So ABA, then we're going to talk about POSAWID. And POSAWID stands for purpose of a system is what it does. And systems and management scientist Stafford Beer developed an important and popular uh, use of this term. And what he really wanted us to understand is when we're assessing a system, we need to focus on what the system actually does rather than um, its ostensible, original, or ideal pur purpose, meaning we want to make sure that we're focusing on the actual outcomes of the system. So what we're going to do in the first part of ABA, after we've done our systems uh, analysis, is we're going to be brutally honest about our starting point. What are the actual outcomes we're seeing in the system in its current state. This is what we call the current postulate, right? And in my example here, I've sort of drawn from my doctoral dissertation from decades and decades ago, which is terrible to say, but true, which is if we look at the welfare system, we could say that the current postulate of the welfare system is exceptionally good at disincentivizing marriage, increasing dependency on the system and creating public stigma against socially disadvantaged women and children. This is circa 1986. So remember that's actually what it was doing. And then what we wanna do is posit what the future uh, outcome would be that we want, the possible way that we would want of the system. So in other words, we, we posit the system as it is and we also posit the system as it should be and then compare and contrast to find the difference. So technically we want the system, the welfare system to do the exact opposite of what I just said the current was. We want it to incentivize family formation when it's appropriate, reduce dependency on the system and create public and political support to empower disadvantaged women with children towards self-sufficiency. And the next step is to really think about the root difference between the current and the future or desired state of the system. So we wanna see what that difference is. And here you can see exactly what those two contrasts to mean in terms of the things we wanna make the system do. And then we're gonna move into the CAS analysis. Remember, we're gonna focus on the agent level when we talk about CAS analysis as part of ABA. And that's really simple. We're gonna ask who and what are the agents in the system? What are the simple rules they're following? How do the simple rules lead to uh, the emergent behavior we're seeing in the system? We can use our flock of birds example really simply. The agents are the birds. They're paying attention to their nearest neighbors. They're following those three simple rules, direction, distance, avoiding predation. And the emergent behavior is that of a superorganism or a flock as a result of all of those interactions. And you can think about that with any of the systems that you're thinking about. And finally, the last step, 
is we're going to think about recommendations and that has two parts to it, a rubric and the recommendations uh, that we face. And we think that this is in many ways why ABA is a method that can really lead to recommendations that meet the complexity of the problems we face. So we develop interventions and as sort of, uh, and recommendations by using a rubric. My slides are not, oh, they're there, they're caught up. All right, we're caught up, this is where we are. So you can see here, we had the root difference. And then what we do is we take the difference in the system and we use that as a way to set forth a rubric for how we're going to design the recommendations that we want. So you come up with some recommendation principles. This, la this list of principles is actually serving as a back check for the propo proposed recommendations that you're gonna make. In other words, you might have an, an infinite number of creative and fantastic recommendations, but in principle, if they violate any of these things, they should be rejected because they're not born of the, the understanding of the system. And you can change your rubric, obviously, as you learn new things about the system. So in this case, we know that no specific recommendation can violate our simple rules, which is it has to encourage family formation when it's appropriate, reduce dependency. Um, it cannot increase stigmatization and political ill will. It has to empower recipients to create self-sufficiency. And it also, we know, has to be feasible in terms of resource allocations and the time um, to delivery of those services. And you can see, I've come up with, and these are actually from my dissertation, which no, you, nobody has read except my mother and my husband. <laughs> uh, but if you wanna read it, we can do that too. But here's some recommendations that we came up with um, broadly that fit into that rubric. And um, you can see that that's going to help us make sure that everything that we've been thinking about is borne out in the way that we approach solving problems. So here's the point. It's my last slide, I promise. Here's my point. As faculty in a public affairs program, what Derek and I see is this huge gap between our analytic methods and the complexity of the issues that have to be addressed to better the human condition to establish effective policy and run these large systems efficiently. And it's this gap that has required a new approach to these VUCA driven complex problems we're all thinking about. Most importantly, the increased complexity we all deal with necessitates an analytical approach that has the teeth needed to meet that complexity head on by focusing on the agent-based simple rules and underlying structure of any issue, topic, or concern that we have. Now, that's the point. My understanding is there's gonna be a q and A. I'm gonna disappear for a second, or are you just gonna come in? I don't know. Here's my moderator. He's back. It's like magic. It's magic. Magic moderator. The magic moderator move. That's a new move. That is Zoom. a new move. The magic yeah. moderator move. Let's get rid of these slides. We're getting rid of the slides. And we'll just we'll just chat. We're gonna chat. Yeah. It's, we Go need ahead. a fireside. I know. We, need a, <laughs> we can do that. I'm just kidding. You want a fireside? There you go. <gasps> This is the fire set. <coughs> fire fire side side chat. Yeah. Do we have like three minutes? <laughs> well, now we got about nine minutes or nine something. Nine minutes. And we have literally hundreds of questions. So, uh, <laughs> oh, that's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. How... There's so many questions. Uh, this is incredible stuff. Hope that. We will have a recording. Yeah, the, all the there will be recordings after the conference. One thing I will also add is we have uh, a ton of printed resources and things that we will post on the website where, that actually give you that process step by step, so you don't have to remember or have taken a million notes. Okay, so here's a here's a question. Uh, Possewood, can you quickly review the key tenants again and why this needs to be done as part of the ABA? I missed some points. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Possewood is, is literally 
what we know from system science is that all systems sort of have a purpose and have an emergent outcome that we see. And we want to make sure that we're looking at what's actually coming out of a system because that is actually demonstrative of what the purpose of that system is. So if you're getting an outcome that you don't like, that means there's something in the design of the system that needs to change at the agent level to give you a different outcome. So we say current possible, like what's actually happening in the system versus what we really want the outcome to be of the system. Then we contrast the two and we know what, what we need to change inside the system at the agent level to reach that sort of desired or future um, state of the system. Yeah. So you're, you're taking what the system's doing rather than than what, what people you, say the system is supposed, supposed to be, to be doing. doing. Right? That's what Stack Repair was like. Don't rely on what people say it's going to be doing. Just observe what it's actually doing. And that and, is its possible. And you're doing in, in an ABA analysis, we're doing two different possibilities, right? Yeah, we're you doing current and future. So you have to be really honest about where you are, you know, starting point in the system. And then if you're not having the things, the outcomes you're seeking or the behaviors out of the system that you desire, then you have to figure out what the desired future state is of that system that you want and work to, to mitigate the difference between the current and the future. Do we That's call what ABA is about. We call that the root difference, right? We is do it? call it yeah. okay. the root difference. You're so yeah. good at this. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a good student. Um, <laughs> this is a great question. How do you handle the complexity of hundreds of questions in the webinar in an effective way? We don't. We don't. The password is not good. The, the, the Zoom needs to help us out here because it's like... We miss so many. It's, there is a long they line of questions just that just in. keep going and going and going. Um, this a is a good question. one here. Uh, in a complex system, how do you determine what is the quote-unquote agent? Oh. Well, so if you look at um, if you look at the flocks and the fish, for example, it's fairly obvious that those are the agents that are. Oh my God, somebody's in between us. Oh, we're <laughs> no. a background. <laughs> uh, the audience isn't seeing that. Sorry, so the audience you, isn't seeing that. If you it. talk Adam, about don't things, do that. the audience isn't seeing them. They kind One of, of our students put us as their background, which was like Misa Nabim, and he totally distracted <laughs> me, and I don't understand why he would sabotage me. But, <laughs> Nonetheless, final... luckily grades are already in. Right? <laughs> they're actually not. No, they're not. Okay. Agents in the system are those um, those uh, fish, those birds, the people who are involved in a, a, a system. Uh, <clears throat> agents don't necessarily have to be uh, only people or things with eyeballs, um, but that's a little more complicated for today. But you know, you what you're really looking at is what are what are, who are the things or what are the agents that are interacting over and over again at that sort of local level that are creating collective dynamics and behavior that are leading to the outcome of the system. That's how you under that's how you come to understand who the agents are, what the agents are in a system. I'm hoping that answered that question. This is a, a great question here. I work I work with ABM, which is agent based modeling. I agree that parameter specificity is problematic. Can we think of applying DSRP to parameter exploration in quotes, e.g. different parameter realizations, different parameterizations according to perspectives, et cetera? Yes, I think that's, an, yeah, that's a very astute point. Yes, we could work more uh, robustly on parameters, we can use DSRP to actually really understand that far better. I actually think that, well, maybe I shouldn't say this on tape, but I actually think that our understanding of ABA might help us also improve or build off of ABM. In other words, create a new modeling method that incorporates um, what we know of DSRP and also what we know of CAS and all the things that we've talked about. Yeah, I mean, a, a, re a really good ABA could could lead to a, uh, a better ABM yes. in many ways. That's yes. the that That's would be the the goal. the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. That's our future possible. <clears throat> Did you say I made a possible joke? That's our future possible. <laughs> wow, possible joke. That you might be a first. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to ask Stafford Beard's wife if if there have been other possible jokes. Um, I doubt many. 
there's probably not a book Systems on possible jokes or anything like that. Shy to share their humor. <laughs> Are you finding another question in thousands of questions? Ah, uh, yes. I'm just there's they're zooming by here. When when you're looking at a system, how frequently do you find it helpful uh -huh. to zoom out and look at the system of which it is a part? I would say all the time, if you can, you should do that. We, I mean, I don't think it came across very well in the presentation because I was pushing through it fairly quickly. We really want to look across levels of scale. We really want to look at not only what the parts are of the things inside our system, but what is our system a part of itself? Like what's the larger context? And that really will extend our understanding of what we're thinking about uh, quite a bit because when you go up and down those levels of scale, you might think of variables and things that you wouldn't have already thought about um, and have a much deeper understanding of the system. Uh, this will probably wrap with this question. Uh, and there's so many good ones. I'm sorry, we won't get to them all, but um, what is the difference between ABA, agent-based approach and DSRP, the, the distinction systems, relationships and perspectives? That's a good question. I mean, I, I'm hoping that it wasn't confusing in the presentation. <clears throat> um, so I would say that DSRP are, are the, the four fundamental things that we do to come to understand something, um, not just systems, but like literally anything. It's how you build meaning. Now, I've, we've plunked DSRP analysis as part of ABA because we don't think that it is at all prudent to go through an analysis and come up to recommendations without having first understood a system completely. And we use DSRP to get that understanding of the system prior to looking at it from that sort of CAS perspective. So they're different, but we do like to make sure that we're emphasizing understanding the system as the first step <clears throat> to an agent-based approach to the kinds of things people are thinking about. And we'll do one more question because it looks like a lot of people are, are sort of looking for ways to build off the talk and learn more. So uh, this is kind of like 12 questions in one, but can you recommend a, a book or some books that we can read on systems thinking to you know, help them get started? On systems thinking, yeah. other than the one we wrote? <laughs> well, that's probably the, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of great books on it. So we have systems thinking made simple. Now, I will say that I think one of the reasons I would recommend that is because it's got a lot of pictures <clears throat> and it's very, like, we really- Accessible. We wrote it to be very accessible. I mean, I, I know Derek told you the story of, of when we met and I started to understand his theory, but, you know, we've worked very hard to make it um, something that people can really access and use because to us, a method that you can't use and something you can, it's just, there's no reason. It all has to be useful. Well, thank you very much. That was thank a great you. talk, very informative. Uh, there's lots more to uh, learn there.